Welcome to the Growing Food and Feeding People podcast. Whether you're a backyard gardener, a market gardener, or a small-scale farmer just starting out or a seasoned grower, this show is for you. Join us as we share tips and tricks, tactics and hacks to growing food for yourself, your family, and your community, as well as sharing stories here from the field and other growers and farmers making a difference in their local food webs. My name is Cody, and I will be your host, so let's get growing. All right, welcome back to the Growing Food and Feeding People podcast. This week, we are going to jump right back into our series all about planting your first garden. So are you planning to start your very own vegetable garden this year, but not quite sure which varieties to grow? You are not alone. The task of choosing what to grow can be just as daunting as how to grow it for a beginner gardener, for sure. And in this episode, we are going to give you a 16-point comprehensive guide on how to choose the right varieties for your very first vegetable garden. So if you really want to dive into the details, maybe even get a little nerdy, this is definitely the episode for you. All right, now the first thing we want to talk about is the importance of considering your climate when choosing which plants to grow. Different varieties grow better in different climates. So it's important to know your climate zone before choosing your plants. Now, for example, I live up here in zone 5B. And if you live up here by me, you may have trouble growing plants like lemons or oranges. You know I'm a huge coffee fan, so I would love to grow some coffee beans. Doesn't really work well up here. However, I can grow blueberries and raspberries and elderberries and apples and cherries. And uh, of course, all of the cool season crops. And we can grow a fair share of the warm season crops as well. Our summer is long enough um, for the majority of them. Now, it is essential to research which plants are suitable for your climate and choose varieties that will thrive in your environment. Now, if you live in a climate zone up here like I do with cold winters in zone 5B, you may want to choose cool season crops that can tolerate frost. Examples of some cool season crops um, that do well up here include kale, grow a bunch of it, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and lettuce. Now, you guys know that salad mix is hands down probably my favorite crop to grow at least in my top three so we grow a lot of kale and a lot of lettuce and a lot of spinach on the other hand if you live in a warmer climate like zone 9a you may want to consider heat tolerant crops like okra and eggplant peppers and sweet potatoes now we can grow a few of those up here but we actually have to start I mean, our, our growing season is not long enough so we have to start those inside um, keep them going and then and then move them outside and still it's not uh, not quite as ideal they're really made for growing in warmer climates so now that you've got a better understanding of your climate let's talk about the importance of knowing your specific growing zone and conditions because it is crucial to be aware of your first and last frost dates so important and how long your growing season is going to be frost free you know here in zone 5b the first frost date is typically around may 22nd and the last frost date is around September 23rd. So that gives me a growing season of approximately 123 days. Um, now, it, it, it may not land exactly on those days, um, but historically there is a 30% chance that you're going to get frost on those dates. And, um, you know, that's enough, that's enough of a percentage to take it seriously. I know myself, it's definitely bit me in the butt. I have lost 50 foot beds of cucumbers because I got too anxious and put them out, um, you know, in the beginning of May <laughs> instead of at the end of May. Uh, and what I've realized that a lot of those crops, you could actually just direct seed and they'll, they'll do just as fine. So you really want to know what your first and last frost states are for you in your area. And you can, a quick Google search will tell you that. I think I looked ours up on the farm, farmersalmanac.com. So real simple to find that. Now it's also important to consider your microclimate, which refers to the specific conditions in your garden, such as the amount of sunlight, wind exposure, and moisture levels. Uh, you may have areas in your garden that receive more or less sunlight than others, or areas that are more protected from the wind. My, my, gar my market garden is a perfect example of that because we've got some pretty tall trees on the south, east, and east side of the garden and then fairly open for the rest of it. So we do get a, the majority of our sunlight, um, but we do have a spot where we can put some more shade tolerant crops in. Um, and that also does help from the wind too. So, so those are different things within your microclimate to consider for sure. 
And by observing these microclimates, you can choose varieties that are better suited for each area of your garden. Now, obviously, one of the biggies there, and should always be one of the first things you consider when planning out where to put your garden, is to consider the amount of sun exposure. Some plants require full sun, while others can thrive in partial shade. You want to make sure to choose varieties that are suitable for the amount of sun exposure that your garden receives. For example, leafy greens like our salad greens, spinach and lettuce, they can tolerate partial shade. While tomatoes and peppers, they really need full sun. And I talk about that quite a bit in our companion planting series, as a matter of fact, because you can use some of the sun-loving plants that may get a little bit taller for shade for crops like your greens that we just talked about that, that don't mind a little more shade. So those are also different microclimates that you can create within your garden, panning, planting, and whatnot. So Now next, let's talk about soil, because it's essential to know your soil type and your pH levels and your NPKs before choosing which plants to grow. Different plants thrive in different soil types, so you want to make sure to choose varieties that will grow well in your soil, or you can amend your soil, which I'm a huge fan of, <laughs> for what you are growing. So there's really, there's really not too many excuses. I mean, of course, there are some people that just live on rock, and that's pretty tough to grow on unless you're putting in raised beds. But for the most part, if you have dirt, um, if you have soil there at all, you should be able to do some amending to that. Uh, to kind of create the perfect soil for what you're growing. And I'm going to do a whole other episode on all the amendments to make to make that happen, uh, to create perfect blends. But, but obviously today we're talking about choosing what to plant and why to plant it, where to plant it, that sort of thing when we're talking about planting your first garden out. So, for example, when it comes to soil and your soil pH, you know, different different plants prefer different soil types. So berry bushes, where we're growing our raspberries and our blueberries, they prefer a slightly more acidic soil with a pH of around 4.5 to 5.5. While annual vegetables, like our salad greens, prefer a pH of 5.8 to 6.5. And then you've got sweet corn that prefers a pH of 5.8 to 7. They really prefer to be up around that 7, a more alkaline soil. You know, Tomatoes prefer a pH of 6.2 to 6.8, while melons, on the other hand, prefer a pH of 6.0 to 6.5. And honestly, if melons drop below, if the soil where you're growing your melons drop below 6.0, you may get a lot of foliage, but you're not going to get many melons. It is important to know where your soil is at. And, and honestly, a soil pH between 6.0 and 7.0 is generally just fine and you're gonna grow a heck of a lot of food. The lower the number in your pH, say for instance, the berry bushes, they're at a 4.5 to 5.5. Well, the lower the number, the more acidic the soil. The higher the number, like say the sweet corn we talked about, prefers to be up around 7.0, that's more alkaline soil. So it's good to know where your soil's at when you're thinking about what veggies you wanna grow. Now. To determine your soil type, you can perform a simple soil test just using a simple soil test kit or by sending a sample of your soil to a lab for analysis, uh, depending on how serious you really want to get. But the results of the soil test will give you information of the pH level, the nutrient levels, and the soil texture. Now, you also, when you're planning out your garden, it's a good idea, if you're planning on doing it more than once, to kind of plan for crop rotation. Crop rotation is an important practice for maintaining soil health and preventing pests and disease. It involves rotating different plants families in the same area over multiple growing seasons. And it's not just growing seasons, you know, I do high rotation growing in our market garden. If I have 10 30 inch by 50 foot beds in one block of beds, I'm more than likely going to have two or three different plantings in each one of those beds throughout the season. So I will actually plan crop rotation, um, not season to season, but from planting to planting within the season. For example, if you grow tomatoes in one area one year, you should plant a different plant family in that area the next year to prevent pests and diseases from building up in the soil. You know, it's, it's really important to rotate your crops each year or each planting if you're doing multiple plantings and high rotation planting throughout the season. Uh, so plan ahead and choose varieties that can easily be rotated with other plants um, in your garden. The next thing you want to think about 
is you want to determine your water source. Uh, it's important to consider how you'll water your garden. And I know that seems kind of general, but as different plants actually have different water requirements. You know, some plants do not need as much water as other plants. So you want to choose varieties that are suitable for your water system and make sure to water them consistently. For example, plants like tomatoes and peppers, they need consistent watering to prevent blossom end rot. However, you don't want to overwater them. So knowing your water source and you're having a good watering system in place or planning for one is really important even when choosing what varieties you're going to grow. So now that you've got a better understanding of climate and soil, let's talk about choosing which vegetables to grow. You know, let's get down to the nitty gritty. <laughs> this is where it gets fun. My first suggestion is, is to start with easy to grow vegetables. If you are a beginner gardener, it's a good idea to start with easy to grow vegetables. So some examples of these would be the tomatoes, the cucumbers, lettuce, and carrots. All of these varieties are low maintenance, well, I'm not gonna say low maintenance, but they are perfect for first time gardeners because they grow pretty easily um, with just a few simple steps. And they are fairly low maintenance if you know what to do next. Now tomatoes, they are one of the most popular vegetables to grow in the home garden. And that's for a good reason. They're easy to grow and they're very, very productive. You know, and they come in a wide variety of colors and flavors. And you've also got your, your determinate tomatoes and your indeterminate tomatoes. Your determinate tomatoes, they don't usually get as big and they don't grow for as long. They have a determined amount of time that they're gonna grow for and pretty much a determined amount of production. Whereas an indeterminate tomatoes, in, in, in all honesty, I love indeterminate tomatoes because they will grow all season long. I can grow them eight to 10 foot tall if I have the trellis for them. So they're one of my favorites and they're, they're pretty easy to grow if you have a string for them to grow up and you do just a little bit of pruning. They are fantastic. So I really, really love cherry tomatoes. Another great one favorite of mine, especially for our salads, is cucumbers. They're a great choice for beginners and they grow quickly and produce an abundant fruit just like the tomatoes. I trellis them exactly the same. And by doing that, you'll produce an abundant amount of cukes for slicing or making pickles. Your lettuce and carrots are both cool season crops that can be grown in the spring and in the fall. And they're both relatively easy to grow if you just take a few simple steps to get them started. And actually, you can grow them throughout the summer if you can grow them in a partially shaded area so they don't get too hot. So those are both fairly easy to grow as well. Now really when it comes to choosing the right varieties, you want to choose vegetables that you love to eat. Now there is no point in growing vegetables that you don't like to eat, you know what I mean? Like if you don't like tomatoes, <laughs> don't grow tomatoes. But however, you really want to choose varieties that you and your family do love to eat so you can enjoy the fruits of your labor because it is work. Um, and depending on the size garden you grow and your methods, it can be a lot of work. So you definitely want to be able to enjoy the fruits of your labor and by choosing veggies that you really enjoy eating, it'll make the whole process that much more enjoyable. Choose varieties that are suited to your cooking needs. When selecting vegetable varieties, consider how you plan to use them in the kitchen. For example, if you love making salsa, choose varieties of tomatoes and peppers that are suitable for that purpose. If you plan to pickle your vegetables, choose varieties of cucumbers that are good for pickling. I know for us, I really love slicer cucumbers for my salads, but my wife really enjoys making pickles and enjoys having them all year long. So this year we're actually cutting back on our slicer varieties and we're gonna up the amount of pickles that we produce. So you definitely wanna choose varieties that are really well suited for your needs. So when choosing the vegetables to grow, think about your favorite recipes and meals. You know, do you love making fresh salsa? Then you might wanna grow some tomatoes, peppers, and onions. Do you enjoy stir fries? then you might want to grow broccoli, carrots, and snow peas. And by choosing vegetables that you love to eat, you'll be way more motivated to care for them and harvest them when the time comes. For a few specific examples of some of the varieties we like to grow right here on the farm, when it comes to tomatoes, at least up here in my growing zone, we really enjoy growing sweetie cherry tomatoes and blueberry cherry tomatoes. They're great on salads and definitely a favorite of our customers. Now for cucumbers, if we're doing slicers, I like to grow Market More 76. That is a great option. It produces a ton of cucumbers and they taste great. So that's my pick for slicers. But if we're gonna grow pickling cucumbers, I really enjoy the Boston pickling cucumber. So we're gonna grow a bunch of those this year again. Now for the beans, you've got your bush beans or your pole beans. I myself, I've done both and I really prefer pole beans only because 
it's a lot easier for my back to harvest a whole 50 foot bed of beans if I don't have to bend over to do it. So I prefer pole beans, but bush beans are also a great option and will produce a ton of beans. And for my choice on beans, I like the Kentucky blue bean. They're a green bean, but they're called Kentucky blue pole beans or Kentucky blue bush beans. And I think that's a great choice. We grow oodles and oodles of beans. Now for lettuce, if you've been following my YouTube channel or the podcast for any amount of time, you know that I love Salanova lettuce. That is my hands down go-to favorite. I've been growing it for years. That's what we grow for our salad mix. And I hardly ever think about growing anything else when it comes to lettuce because I just love it. It's very consistent. It's very tasty. Um, it lasts a good amount of time in the cooler and the fridge. Hands down, Salanova lettuce is my favorite. When I'm doing our salad mix, I like to grow the Salanova red butter, Salanova green butter, the Salanova green sweet crisp, and the Salanova red sweet crisp. Then I will add some baby spinach and some baby kale that I grow. Now, the only downfall to Salanova is that the only place you can get it is from Johnny's Seeds, which isn't a bad thing. I've ordered a lot of seeds from Johnny's over the years, and I still order, of course, all of my Salanova lettuce and a few other things. I get the rest of my seeds typically from True Leaf Market, um, but I do get all of my Salanova lettuce seeds from Johnny's. It's the only place in the world you can get it. <laughs> so they've kind of got the market cornered on that. They're a little bit pricey, but man, especially if you're selling it um, at market or for a CSA or to restaurants, I wouldn't grow anything else myself personally. I love Salanova lettuce. Um, but even for our own consumption um, and for our neighbors, that's that's what I grow. Now when it comes to growing carrots, I really enjoy growing the Scarlet Nantes. We're going to grow a bunch of those on the farm this year. Um, tender sweet carrot. So I like a, I like a sweet carrot. Um, and I love growing carrots. I grow them all season long as well. I'm actually going to go out and harvest some early spring carrots probably this weekend um, that I left in the ground last fall on purpose because they are... Once the ground freezes up, it releases the sugars, and man, those things are sweet. So I love me some fresh carrots. Um, now, now, as far as the bunching onions go, that's another thing that we grow pretty much all the time. It's a great companion plant for a lot of the crops we grow. Um, they're easy to grow. So I like, I like growing bunching onions, and I like specifically the Tokyo Whites. They've been very consistent and very reliable. That's what I like to grow for bunching onions. It's a great choice, as are radishes. It wouldn't be right to start a garden without growing some radishes. Man, those things are a quick win. You can grow them in about 28 days. That's a great filler crop. They're great on salads. If you're waiting for a little bit longer season crop, grow up. Radishes are a great one to throw in next to them. My favorite, hands down, as far as radishes go, is probably the French breakfast radish. I grow a handful of different varieties of radishes, but the French breakfast radish is probably my favorite. The next thing we want to really think about is to consider the space you have. And this should probably be one of the very first things you think about is consider the space you have. If you have a small garden or limited space, you're going to want to choose compact varieties that won't take up too much space. Examples would include bush beans, cherry tomatoes, and patio peppers. Right? Bush beans are a good choice for small gardeners uh, because they don't require a lot of support and they take up less space. However, myself personally, I'm a huge fan of the pole bean um, because from a square foot perspective, a pole bean plant doesn't take up any more space than a bush bean plant. But if you have a pole stuck up there that it can grow up, you're going to get a heck of a lot more production. and You're going to get a heck of a lot more beans off it and really not take up any more space. So the pole beans are, are typically my go-to. So that being said, you really want to think about vertical gardening as well. If you have limited space, consider growing some of your plants up. <laughs> Any of my vining or climbing plants, I like to grow up on a trellis. Um, so that, of course, would include my cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, and, and pole beans. So this involves training the plants to grow up the trellises or other structures, which you can save space and increase your yield for sure. Um, examples of vegetables that can grow vertically, like I said, are your tomatoes, cucumbers, and pole beans. I trellis all three of those, and they, it works fantastic. Now, you could also consider using raised beds. Raised beds are a great option for gardeners with poor soil or limited space. A raised bed will allow you to control the soil type and the depth, and they also provide better drainage. So you can purchase pre-made raised beds, of course, or, you know I'm a DIY guy, build your own, of course, using wood, concrete blocks, or other materials. But raised beds are a great option um, when you're working with limited space. A nice small 4x8 raised bed 
can grow a heck of a nice little kitchen garden or an herb garden for sure. Now before you buy your seeds, be sure to check the seed packet for the information on the back of it. They should have all the information you need on how much space the plants need, how many days to maturity, meaning how long it's going to take from seed to harvest. So when you're thinking about the varieties you want to choose, definitely check the back of the seed packets before you buy them. Now that being said, you could also consider starting with transplants. If you're not confident in starting seeds from scratch, which is totally fine, a lot of beginner gardeners aren't, and I know a lot of folks that have been growing for years that still go out and buy starts. You know, I start 99% of all our plants from seed. However, there are a few things. There are a couple things like, say, my hot pepper plants. I will start those from seed, but I will usually go and buy a few extras from some organic farmers that I know just in case mine don't pan out because they take a little bit longer growing season. So I love I love having hot peppers. So as a backup, I'll even buy a few starts. So don't be afraid to consider starting with transplants um, rather than starting your own seed. That's totally okay. And they're usually pretty easy to find at a local nursery or a garden center. You know, I would also definitely suggest checking with your local small farmers. I know myself, I've sold starts in the past and I know a handful of local farmers around here that do intentionally grow extra so they can sell starts. And that's a great choice because transplants are young plants that have already germinated and grown up to a certain size, making them a heck of a lot easier to care for than starting them from seed. Now another thing we really want to think about, and something that I think is overlooked quite a bit, and I know has caught me off guard my first year or two starting out, was accounting for pests. Different plants attract different pests, so it's important to consider pest control when choosing what to grow. You know, we do everything organic here, so I don't use any, any chemical pesticides or anything like that. So choosing varieties that are less attractive to pests or that have a natural pest repelling properties is pretty important. For example, marigolds have a natural pest repellent that can be planted around your garden. And another thing you can consider is using companion planting for pest control. You know I'm huge on companion planting, so much so that I'm doing a whole separate series on it on YouTube and a whole series on it here on the podcast separate from this planting your first garden series um, because I believe in companion planting that much and pest control is one of the reasons why you know companion planting is a gardening technique that involves planting certain plants together that benefit each other some plants can help repel pests or attract beneficial insects for example like I said marigolds are known to repel pests like aphids white flies while planting herbs like dill and parsley can attract beneficial insects like ladybugs and lacewings. So companion planting is definitely something you want to consider if only for the pest control alone. There's a lot of other reasons that companion planting is fantastic and I think essential in the garden. But we're not going to get into all those today because well we're doing a whole series on it. <laughs> now the next thing we really want to consider and factor in is pollination. Some plants require pollination in order to produce fruit. So you're going to want to consider whether you need to attract pollinators such as bees and butterflies or if you need to hand pollinate certain plants. For example, if you're growing squash or cucumbers, if you don't have the pollinators, you may need to hand pollinate them to ensure a good harvest. Now I think it's a great idea to plant some flowers to attract uh, the pollinators for sure. It's going to do nothing but benefit your garden. Now the last thing I would really consider if you're just starting out or even if you're not starting out and you haven't done this yet is really consider looking into joining a local gardening group. That could be in person, locally, or online, say one of your local Facebook groups. They can be a great way to get advice and support from experienced gardeners right there in your area. They can also provide you with information about local growing conditions, specific plant varieties that work best right there in your environment, and gardening events like day workshops to learn a new skill there in the garden or where your local farmers markets are being held. Now starting your first veggie garden can be an exciting and rewarding experience but it can also be pretty daunting. So by considering your climate, your soil, your space, your personal taste and a few other factors you can choose the right varieties for your first garden. Remember to start small and choose easy to grow vegetables. And don't be afraid to ask for help, for sure. With a little patience and perseverance, 
you will soon be enjoying the fruits of your labor and growing a ton of food and feeding people. And by taking these additional factors into account, you can make much more informed decisions about which plants to grow in your first veggie garden. Remember, gardening is a process of trial and error. Definitely a great big experiment. I say that all the time, and I do a ton of different experiments here on the farm intentionally, and some not intentionally. <laughs> they happen, but I learn from them for sure. So don't be afraid to experiment and try new things. Now, if you're getting a ton of value out of this and you think it might be beneficial to maybe chat with me one-on-one -on -one, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, I'm going to leave a link down in the description of the podcast and I'm pretty easy to reach. Now, this show just wouldn't be complete if I didn't ask the question, why did the tomato turn red? <laughs> because he saw the salad dressing. <laughs> Hopefully you have been inspired or entertained, learned something or laughed. I truly hope you're enjoying the podcast, and that, as always, I cannot thank you enough for tuning in and joining me every week. If you'd like to continue the conversation, we can chat over on Facebook at Simplistic Farms LLC, or you can send us a comment over there on YouTube at Simple Ain't Easy, Simplistic Farms. And of course, you can listen to the Growing Food and Feeding People podcast on all of the platforms, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, wherever you like to listen to your favorite podcasts at, you can find us there. If you'd like to support the show or get involved in Project Feed Your Neighbor, there is a link down in the show notes, or you can find us over on patreon.com at patreon slash simplistic farms. We hope you have a great week. Make somebody smile. We'll talk to you on the next one.